Hi everyone, it's Mr. H here, and in this video I'm going to look at the inclined plane pulley problem. If you haven't already seen the pulley problem video in my last video, you want to go back and check that out first. Given the diagram and the information on the right, find the acceleration of the system and find the magnitude of the force of tension in the rope. Now, there are a couple of things worth considering in a situation where we have this inclined plane. One is this. If this mass is actually heavy enough and the force of friction is actually low enough, what could happen is it could actually slide this way. Now in most of the cases that we're going to see, it's actually going to go the other way. But note, if this mass is much smaller, it would slide in the direction the arrows are showing right now. But because mass 1 here is bigger, that I've circled, you'll notice that it has to go in this direction. So clearly here, this is going to be the positive direction because this would have to be a much bigger mass than this one, especially at a 30 degree angle, to actually cause it to travel in the other direction. So some assumptions that we're going to make here, it's important to just state first because these aren't necessarily the same assumptions that you might make in, say, a first year university course or something like that. One assumption is that the rope has no mass. So in actuality, we know it does. Another one is that the pulley is frictionless. And if you take first year physics, you're going to notice in university, you'll notice that one of the things you assume is that the pulley is not frictionless. And you take into account the moment of inertia, which is another mathematical calculation um, that you do in first year university. The other assumption we're going to make here is that the rope uh, does not stretch. So with all those assumptions in mind, and this is going to be the assumptions for all pulley problems, we need to think about things in terms of the parallel portion and the perpendicular portion. What I mean by that is everything that's happening in this direction, that is the parallel portion. So whether it's happening that way or it's happening in this direction, like the force of friction would be, that's the parallel the component. The perpendicular component is this component. Whatever's happening up and down, so F... Uh, Fn in this case, but remember that Fg in this on this mass is not going to be in the perpendicular component. We actually need to break that Fg up into the part of it that's in the parallel component, because part of it's going to be pointing that way, and then we also need to break it up into the part that's in the perpendicular component, because part of it's going to point that way when we break it into the two components. The only thing I'll add here is that we're going to refer to the perpendicular part like that. That's how we're going to identify if something's perpendicular and if something's parallel with two diagonal lines. So let's go ahead and draw the free body diagrams. That's the first thing we always want to do with these types of questions. Draw the free body diagrams. So for mass 2, which is the one on the angle, we know that that's an angle like so. We know that it's going to have, as we already alluded to a minute ago, this force of gravity on mass 2 in this direction. We know that it's going to have a normal force that's always perpendicular to the surface of contact. There's going to be a force of tension that's going to be accelerating it up the ramp if we overcome the force of friction. And because we're told that it's kinetic friction, we're assuming that it's already moving. And we're going to have this kinetic force of friction here. Now let's just go ahead, as I alluded to a minute ago, and let's break this force of gravity into its two components. So we have the force of gravity of the second mass that is perpendicular to the direction of motion. Likewise, we have the force of gravity, and I can draw it there, I can draw it off the middle of the object, it doesn't matter. The force of gravity on that second object that is parallel to the direction of motion. Now notice that that's acting to oppose the motion. Nonetheless, it's still in the same uh, plane as it, and so it's parallel to it. So the force of kinetic friction and this force of gravity in the parallel direction are going to both oppose while the force of tension is going to be pulling it forwards and accelerating the whole system forwards. Let's go ahead and draw the mass, the free body diagram of the first mass. And this one's just like we've had before where there's a force of gravity and there's a force of tension on that first mass. So the force of gravity, just to be very clear about that, because it's accelerating, has to be larger than the force of tension. 
because it's going in this direction and it's accelerating in that direction as well. Likewise, this is the positive direction and it's accelerating in that direction. So overall, and we identified it on the original diagram, this entire thing is positive. So what direction is positive changes as you go around the pulley. Well, what does the system free body diagram look like? Well, for the system free body diagram, what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw it vertically. Some people like to draw it horizontally. It doesn't really matter. But this is now the total mass. And so we would say that the force that's pulling it forwards is the force of gravity 1. And we would say that the only two forces acting to oppose it are the force of kinetic friction that acts on that second mass and the force of gravity on the second mass in the parallel direction. Remember that these two forces are internal. So we ignore those on the system free body diagram. So again, this is the positive direction. It's going to accelerate in that direction. And so we can set up something now to, using Newton's second law, to solve for the acceleration using those three forces. The only real catch to what we haven't done before is that this right here needs to incorporate the angle of 30 degrees. And as we'll find with the kinetic force of friction, that also has to incorporate the angle to some extent. So you could go ahead and calculate these separately and then sub them in. What I'm going to do is I'm going to break them down algebraically and put everything into one equation and solve it at the end. So again, from the system free body diagram, that's what I'm doing this from, I'm going to set up Newton's second law, as I've always done for pulley problems. F net equals mass, it's the total mass, times the acceleration. The net force is those three forces, so it's the force of gravity plus the force of kinetic friction plus the force of gravity parallel to the motion. And we can see that these two are negative. So we can go ahead and we can strip the vector signs from those. And because this one's positive, because it's acting in the forward direction, we could just write this as Fg1 minus Fk minus Fg2 parallel. I'm keeping the vector on the acceleration because I'm trying to determine the direction of the acceleration at the end, which better be positive. If we don't get a positive number, we've done something wrong. I'll break these forces down off to the side and sub them in once we've gotten them all broken down into all their individual parts, just to see what's happening a little clearer. Fg1 is nothing near to, new to us. That is acting in the same direction as the positive direction. So then we could say that's m1 times g. Fk seems like there's nothing new to us, but there is something finicky that's going to happen here in a second, and that is that it's mu k fn. Well, what is fn? How do we determine fn? It's not equal to fg. What it is equal to is it's equal to fg2 perpendicular. Well, what is fg2 perpendicular? So let's write this as mu k fg2 perpendicular. It's Because this is a 30 degree angle in here, Whatever the angle is, um, if I just go back to the diagram really quickly so you see this, whatever the angle is of the slope, that's the same angle that Fg is changed from the vertical. And if you just, you can think about it, if it helps, you could draw a very, very small angle and see that that angle over here would be very, very small as well, that those angles are indeed the same. So those angles are the same. So what we have to do is we know Fg2 and we have to use sine and cosine to break it down to fg2 perpendicular. Well, because sine theta, sine of this in this case is a 30 degree angle, is the opposite over the hypotenuse, that means that it would be fg2 parallel over fg2. If you rearrange that, you get fg2 times sine of theta, is equal to fg2 parallel. And so we can, if we find fg2 parallel in an equation, we can replace it with fg2 sine theta because we know how to find fg2. That's just m2 times g, and then we multiply it by sine of theta. Likewise, 
cosine of theta is adjacent. Well, the adjacent sine in that triangle, the adjacent side in that triangle is the FG2 perpendicular. So it's the adjacent over the hypotenuse, FG2. Again, rearranging that, we get FG2 times cosine of the angle is equal to FG2 perpendicular. And that's M2 times G. We just break down M FG2, and as I did before, into M2 times G. And that multiplied by cosine theta is what FG2 perpendicular is equal to. Well, how convenient. We've just, uh, our equation that we just had gives us FG2 perpendicular. So this is mu K, if I can get it to write properly. This is mu K m2 g cosine of 30 degrees in this case. And then if that's fk, we'll sub that in in a minute, let's do fg2 parallel. Well, we've already solved that, right? That's m2 times g times sine of the angle. So these are the three things that I'm going to come now and solve into or substitute into my equation. And when I substitute those three values in, I can then rearrange for acceleration by dividing by the total mass and get an answer. So let's do that now. So we get m1 times g minus mu k m2 g times cos of the angle minus m2 g times sine of the angle. And then if I divide both sides, like I said, by the total mass, Whatever you do to one side, you have to do to the other. So then I'm going to be left with acceleration. So subbing these values in, I'll do that in my next step without showing you on the video because I know you know how to sub things in. And we'll see if we get the same answers. It does get long and tedious, but really it's just following the steps that we're familiar with. And what we get for our final answer is 2.775 meters per second squared. Hey, it's positive. That means it's forwards. So we can conclude, therefore... The system will accelerate at, and I didn't tell you how many sig digs, I've put a decimal after the 30 to mean two sig digs, but you might think it's one based on the 30 degrees, but it's going to be, if it's two sig digs, 2.8 meters per second squared forwards. The last thing to do now is just find the force of tension. So that we go back to the easiest free body diagram, the one that we did of mass one. And we can notice that there's no components or anything we need to break into different parts. So that makes it really straightforward. It's in fact the same thing we did um, for our last uh, pulley problem when we did not have the incline. So the net force is mass 1 times acceleration. The net force is FT1 plus FG1. And then because the FT1 is negative, and FG1 is positive, we expect that we're going to get a negative number when I do this math here. I'm going to substitute FG1 in as positive, so I'm not going to change the sign here. This is M1 times G. And then by plugging those numbers in, the M1 was 4 kilograms times the acceleration of 2.775. Notice I'm keeping those extra two significant digits. And it was a positive because it's in the, it accelerated in the positive direction. And from that, I'm going to subtract 4 kilograms times 9.8 meters per second squared, or 9.8 newtons per kilogram. And that gives me a force of tension of negative 28.14 newtons. And we conclude, therefore, the force of tension or the magnitude of the force of tension is 28 newtons. So there you go. The idea with these types of problems is to break things up into their parallel and perpendicular components. And from there, it's just following the same steps that we've done for pulley problems in the past.